Okay, can everyone see my screen? Beautiful. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ESCA Federal Programs Office Hour for Tuesday, October 10th. Again, I am Rita. You're joined by Ryan, Jess, Daniel, Tyra, Renee, um, and Travis. And then we are especially introducing today um, a new member of our team. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Monique Sullivan. Welcome back, Monique Sullivan. We're excited to welcome her as our new Continuous School Improvement Coordinator. Um, she's an experienced educator with over 20 years in public education as a classroom teacher and a school administrator, I believe principal for many years, um, spanning grades PK through 12. Um, and most of you probably know Monique because she's been a Title I program coordinator. She was at, on the ESSER team and has been an ESE regional program manager. So Monique, if, you can, if you're here, which I know you are, come say hi. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the great welcome. It is nice to be back in ESCA world. Um, I just wanted to say though, that uh, Renee Riley is gonna stay on for a couple of more, a little bit, a couple more months to help with the transition. And also that Cheryl is on a family medical leave right now. So she's gonna be gone until about the mid November. So Renee is gonna help stay on a little bit and help with that um, transition and also with uh, Cheryl be, uh, being out. So um, welcome, it's great to be back and I can't wait to work with you guys on the tier three um, application. So thank you. Awesome, okay. <clears throat> Without further ado, we will continue. Um, and Travis has the bulk of the fun stuff today. So Travis, you can take it away. All right, good morning, everyone. Um... Thank you all for joining us today. As we all know all too well, um, it's that time of year where we kind of dive into uh, reporting on kind of the goings on of the last school year. Um, so you have recently got some um, messaging through grants for me that the FY23 performance report is now open. Um, as a reminder, um, for those who've been around for a while and, and those who may be new to their positions, um, the performance report uh, is a series of pages basically where you're going to report out on both uh, programmatic and fiscal uh, work for the FY23 school year. Uh, and the quote unquote performance report is essentially something that lives within your 23 application uh, and is characterized by um, a number of new pages that become enabled um, at the time of creating a new revision uh, that basically have that performance report uh, prefix to them. So if you're trying to get in and work on the performance report and you're not seeing anything, uh, make sure you go ahead and create a new revision to your FY23 application, um, because as soon as you do that, you will see all of those new pages populate within your application. Now, um, I know that as part of this process, you know, business offices are often uh, working to get caught up on billing, uh, particularly for FY23 funds. And so if you're in a situation where your business office is trying to bill for an expense, um, but may need to make some budget adjustments to the FY23 application in order to do so, um, you may run into a little bit of a stumbling block where uh, the application won't allow you to submit because there are some required responses for the performance report that have not been completed. Um, so if you run into that situation, um, really the only solution we have at this point in time is to navigate to each of those uh, required fields for the performance report and basically enter a placeholder response um, for the time being. And we've more or less asked folks to just put, you know, TBD to be determined um, in those fields. Um, I think they're mostly related to reporting on goals and, and things like that. Um, so by virtue of doing that, you'll be able to kind of make your budget updates, submit them, get them approved, you know, wrap up billing and then kind of go back in and, and follow up with that performance report piece. So just a couple of quick reminders on the performance reports. Um, they are due November 1st this year. Um, and as I just indicated a little bit ago, um, it is important that folks get caught up on billing for FY23 funds before going in to complete the performance report. Um, it's not happened all that often in the last year or so, but we do sometimes run into situations where um, a district may try to complete their performance report based on year-to-date billing. 
um, which, which in some instances is not accurate. You know, if you've only built through June, there'd be that extra three months worth of time um, that's included in that performance report period that's not been accounted for. So that would be a situation where, you know, you go through all this work, do the reporting, only to have to have us kick it back for um, updates through that September 30th date. So please make sure that when you're working with your business offices that the, the billing is done through that September 30th end date um, before going in and working on the performance report itself. Um, as far as the actual submission of the performance report, just like it is now with the, the applications, um, that submission is not considered final until such time as it is uh, electronically certified by the district superintendent which is characterized by that uh, LEA authorized rep approved status. Um, so again, it, just something to be aware of as, as you kind of go through the process here. You know, if, if you've submitted on your end, um, that's great, but there also needs to be kind of that chain of events that happens um, for approvals that ultimately results in the superintendent um, certifying the performance support, which is what constitutes approval on our end um, by the district, which then kind of prompts our uh, state level review of that submission. Um, we also, for folks, again, if you need a refresher or if you may be new to your position, um, we have uh, a number of training videos on our website uh, and how to complete the performance report. And I think it looks like Jess has been kind enough to throw that link in chat for me. Um, so if anyone would like to access that, um, feel free to navigate to that page. Um, and I believe there's a specific performance report trainings section with a series of videos you can refer back to. Okay, so along with the kind of launch of the 23 performance report, there are a couple of uh, minor updates that have been made this year that we just wanna draw your attention to. Uh, the first of which being that on the basically school and district uh, profile pages where um, folks would normally have to uh, self-report their proposed goals from the application and then their actual outcomes uh, in relation to those goals. We now have it in such a way that the, those pages will auto-populate the goal from your uh, last approved application. Uh, so the only information you need to enter now is your um, actual outcome achieved um, because that goal information will automatically populate on that page for you. Um, for those folks that have non-public schools, uh, you'll also notice that there is an updated um, non-public school uh, carryover reconciliation form available for download. Um, and this is a, a revised form that all folks will need to use uh, who have any non-public schools that may not have fully expended um, or may not have fully leveraged, I should say, um, their uh, equitable services funding amount. Uh, and just basically the, the key takeaway there is there'll be some, some different questions. And um, as we've kind of now moved out of kind of the, I'll say the, the more significant concerns with, with COVID-19 and the pandemic and whatnot, there is now kind of a higher level of scrutiny or a higher um, burden of proof required on the part of um, your non-public school partners to demonstrate that the need for carryover funds exists. So you'll notice that again, there's some different questions there um, and we'll need a little bit greater level of detail or justification from your non-public school partners uh, in order to justify carryover of ESEA funds. Um, another minor update, um, we have a new page in the performance report specific to Title IV Part A funds. Um, and it's, it's basically a supplemental data page, similar to what you would have um, normally completed for the Title I program, um, but the, the data that's collected in it is, is very simple. Um, if you're a school district that perhaps transfers all of your Title IV-A funds to another program, um, it's, it, this is still a page that you'll need to complete, but um, you'll just basically enter NA uh, in the few responses that exist on that page. Um, and then one other kind of minor update here, not specifically within the performance report itself, but just kind of in the broader scope of um, 
submitting and receiving state approval on the uh, FY23 performance report. We've now reached a point in time where uh, FY21 funds uh, for ESEA need to be closed out. And so I'll talk about that more here briefly in a moment, but just be aware that that closeout uh, will be a requisite for receiving state approval on your FY23 uh, ESEA performance report. Okay, so as I just mentioned, um, we've now reached a point in time where it's uh, it's basically time to work toward closing out your FY21 ESEA awards uh, through the FY21 application. Uh, the reason this is happening now, as opposed to say a year ago, uh, is because that Maine received a tidings amendment waiver, which basically extended the period of availability for FY21 funds for an additional 12 months. Um, so those, those funds are basically available for obligation through September 30th of this year. Um, and more or less, just like we, we talk about with the, um, the FY23 performance report, it'll be important to work with your business offices to uh, basically get caught up or reconcile all outstanding, excuse me, ex, um, outstanding expenditures uh, through September 30th uh, before going in and working toward closing out FY21 funds. Now, you may be asking yourself, okay, that's all good and well, how do I actually go about uh, closing out 21? So uh, the process is very similar to what you would normally do for uh, the performance report itself. The difference being that everyone has already completed a performance report for FY21 funds. So essentially what you'll need to do to actually close out funds is you're gonna create one final revision to the FY21 application. And you're basically gonna update each of those pages um, that have that performance report prefix that are a uh, budget expenditure page or a project expenditure page. So basically all that we're doing with this final revision is updating each of your project-based expense reporting pages with the total amount of funding that was spent against that project for the year, or for, rather for the, the period of time that funds were available. So in essence, this is almost kind of like a mini secondary performance report where you're just going in to update those expenditure pages with your final expenses for uh, the period of performance. Okay, so um, again, it's important to make sure that all outstanding billing for 21 funds is, is done and completed before you go in to make that final revision. Um, again, just as is the case with anything else we do, uh, it's important that ESEA coordinators, business managers, and ultimately superintendents put eyes on those um, before they get submitted. Um, and then on our end, we'll end up doing one uh, one final set of reviews for those, uh, just to make sure that funds have been expended the way they've been reported, um, that we then at the state level can close out those awards. Now, one thing to be mindful of is um, once a district receives state approval on that FY21 closeout, for all intents and purposes, that application can no longer, again, be updated, amended, edited, what have you. Um, there's actually a specific status in the Grants for Me system that we at the state will move that application to, after which point that application can no longer change to a different status. So it's very important, again, that with that final submission, everything be as accurate as possible um, on those expense reporting pieces, because if something for whatever reason we determine a month or two down the road wasn't reported accurately, um, we won't have the opportunity to go back in and change it. So um, again, something new, something that'll kind of continue on here as we move forward year to year, um, you know, with the performance report will also come the uh, closeout of typically the preceding fiscal year, um, for the next year or so, it will likely be uh, two years 
um, ago because of the the tidings amendment waivers we've had, which have kind of pushed things out a little further than they were normally would be. Um, so before mo moving on, Rita, I'm, I'd like to maybe pause and see if we have questions on any of that. I've seen quite a few things pop up in chat, but um, let's see here. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Performance port is, is heavy. So for folks who wanna ask specifically about what you just heard, we can take a moment. Okay, so Cynthia asks, can invoicing occur while I am working on the performance report? So Cynthia, when when you say invoicing, are you referring to just invoicing in general, invoicing for a specific fiscal year? Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, uh, so if I'm working on um, the performance report, so invoicing for that year's performance report for 23. Mm -hmm. So I have it open. I've been working on, I've got a lot of the narrative already done, um, but the invoicing from July to September hasn't happened. It's ready to go, but it hasn't been sent in yet. So what you can do in that case, Cynthia, is you, you, you're by all intents and purposes, you can um, start that revision and begin populating the performance report with the information that you have. Um, so things like goal reporting and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, what I would avoid doing, however, is working toward completing those expenditure pages um, until such time as your business office has had an opportunity to catch up. Because um, what you may run the risk of is, let's say, for example, you know, um, let's say you just kind of go into the system and and grab some um, figures and start plugging in numbers. There, there is the potential at that point that um, what you're entering may not exactly align with what actually ends up getting billed for um, through September. So. Again, it, it would be something where I'd recommend holding off on that submission until uh, your business office is caught up. If okay. That makes sense. But they can still do the invoicing when it's technically open. That's really was more of my question. The only, yep. The only way they okay. wouldn't be able to, to bill for expenses is if as part of opening up the application or working on that revision, if you started making adjustments to your actual project budgets. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're just basically reporting on outcomes, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be any issue. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Uh, yep. Travis question from Gail about whether the title four supplemental page includes non-public school projects. So Gail, yes, it does, um, but it's a very, it's a very simple page. Um, it's just, it, it asks, I think, one or two questions, um, and it's just basically the extent to which uh, progress is being made on um, Title IV A funded project work. So let, let's say, for example, I don't know, uh, you guys were doing some sort of school-wide PBIS project to address behavior uh, in one of your school buildings. Um, you know, there, there may be a question around, okay, well, related to your safe and healthy student project work, to what extent is has the SAU uh, made progress in achieving its goals? And it's, it's basically, it's all self-reported. And it's, like I said, it's very simple. Um, shouldn't be anything out of left field or anything where you've got to pull you know, copious amounts of data. Okay. Um, and then just did answer Aaron's. And I know we've got our school improvement team who might have to head out at 930. So uh, feel free to keep asking performance report questions. Renee, I know you wanted to make sure um, to explain the, the difference in your program's years with closeout. Um, so I believe you're so next. Rita, I'm just going to answer yeah. one more here that was sent to me privately. Oh, okay. Yep. So it says, if we already spent down money previously, i.e. last year, do we still need to close out? Um, and the answer to that is yes. So if you've already fully expended your FY21 funds, now is an opportune time to go in and create that final revision to your FY21 application um, and complete that the project-based expense reporting to close out FY21 funds. 
Okay, thank you. Renee. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Rita, because I do have to hop off here for another meeting, but I did want to um, just clear up any confusion for business managers as they're uh, invoicing for their school improvement grants if they have a school that happens to have that um, grant as well. <clears throat> the FY22 school improvement grant does use FY21 Title I Part A fund set aside. So when Travis was talking about that tidings amendment waiver that extended the deadline for those obligations of those funds, that um, tidings amendment waiver that he was referencing for FY21 one funds actually backs the FY22 school improvement grant. So for the FY22 school improvement grant, all of those um, funds should have been obligated by September 30th of 2023. So just two weeks ago or so. And all of the invoices for the FY22 school improvement grant needs to be invoiced by December 31st of 2023. So that is, you know, just to clear up that confusion, uh, that that FY21 funds does back the FY22 school and permit grant. So when we're referencing that, um, those fundings to be expended and invoiced for, that is the grant that we are talking about in the school improvement grant world. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay. Fall monitoring. Did you want me to take this or sure. Daniel, did you want to lead this either way? It's fine. Um, I'll hop on. Um, all right. So lots going on with monitoring for districts identified as medium or high. Again, that identification is found in your GANs in Grants for Me, your grant award notifications. So for those that are marked as medium or high on those GANs, you are being monitored. Um, so we have some items on our website. They're in the monitoring tool. If you are identified, um, you need to provide evidence. There's a bunch of fact sheets on the website. I can pop the website in the link after the slide um, with more description of what each of those items are. Those items, all the evidence needs to be uploaded by this Friday, October 13th. If you have questions about um, the fiscal specific items, you'll want to reach out to Tyra Corson. Her name is on those fact sheets. And if they're about more generic ESEA items, then you'll reach out to your regional program manager. Um, again, if you're medium, you're only going to do the medium items. If you're high, you're gonna do the high items, so. And medium. And also. medium, sorry, thank you. Yep. Um, and a lot of the monitoring items I understand are fiscally related, except for one, a couple, Jess, and I know one you're going to talk about right now. Yep. Yeah. So um, one of the Title I items, item A2, is only for targeted assistance schools. Um, and I just wanted to note, I added in this um, highlighted section onto the fact sheet because we, we got so many questions on it. Um, one of the pieces of evidence to show, um, you know, more detail about how the targeted program is running in your school, if you have a targeted Title I program, is to include a student list. That student list should be redacted. So you can just say student A, student B. Um, we don't want to know their specific names. So just wanted to highlight that new uh, language on the fact sheet for item A2. Yep. It's important that we maintain student privacy because the goal is not here to really know the kids. It's to understand the identification process. So um, for Title I, please be aware of that. Okay, and the Title I Summer Reallocated Application. I love these applications. I have to say I've been really enjoying, I always enjoy reading the effective practices that folks self-report. There have been apparently some amazing field trips this year. There have been some awesome engagement, family um, coordination, just really proud of how this funding is used. So thank you coordinators who apply for this extra funding. Um, I know it's extra work. I know it's extra things to think about, but I really hope your summer programs are um, were 
successful and you felt like the students were able to make gains. With that being said, of course, that means this money has is dried up um, and the performance report now to close out this grant is here. The time is now. Um, I always had October 15th as the deadline. I realize that's a Sunday. Um, October 16th is a Monday. Just be aware that everything is happening right now. <laughs> that these performance, the summer reallocation really, the last day to obligate was 930. So again, similar to our other ESEA performance report, these are reallocated funds that are really gone. These are old funds, FY21 funds. Um, so please, uh, similar to how you uh, deal with the ESEA, there's a performance report page that populates once you click revision started. Um, the performance report for Title I specifically is not it's not too crazy. It's usually just how many students ended up being there, what was the attendance, um, how many teachers were hired, goal outcomes, and then of course, what did you spend your money on? And mostly I look at that expenditures match invoices and that the district is really done with this funding. Um, you'll see this year there's a checkbox in the performance report just to indicate if you did have any remaining funds and you're not using them up, that way I don't need to come and email you and confirm that you're actually done with invoicing. So it just saves some back and forth from last year. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna enjoy continuing to read these um, and uh, learn about the programs as well as um, ensure that you guys are done with your funds and done with uh, close out of this particular program. Ryan? All right. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Um, just want to talk a little bit about Title IIA and course reimbursement as we've received some questions on this lately and thought it would benefit everyone to address them. Um, first of all, keep in mind, uh, Rita, did we jump ahead a slide? I don't know. Maybe. Did it, is there a slide missing here? There's two slides for Title II and course reimbursement. Oh, no. I must not. No. Okay. Do you want That's me to? That's all right. Okay. Nope. We're good. I got this. Okay. Um, so keep in mind, Title IIA can be used for course reimbursement when we're talking about increasing teacher and principal quality. So this is something that needs to be connected to a high needs area in your ESEA application for either the school or the district. And I'm really intentional with that language because in the past we have seen some applications that have said things like, uh, we're paying for tuition reimbursement so our teachers can get recertified. And even though we know they can use credits they receive from grad school or from an undergrad to get recertified, that can't be the reason why title funds are paying for the courses themselves. Right. It still needs to be connected to a high needs area of the district. And this actually does come back to kind of a supplanting concern because teachers are required to be recertified. So we want to make sure the reason why we're paying for these courses is because um, they tie to one of your high needs areas. It's just like everything else in our ESEA application. On top of that, you've got to remember that um, these funds cannot be reimbursed until the course has been successfully completed in the same way that uh, costs for a conference can't be reimbursed until after the conference is completed. So someone has to have successfully completed that coursework, and then the reimbursement can come to us. Another thing to keep in mind when we talk about uh, supplanting concerns is that if your district contract for your teachers or your principals includes this as a benefit, this course reimbursement, we also may have to consider supplement not supplant being an issue. So we want to make sure that the district has exhausted any state and local funds that you've budgeted towards course reimbursement first before you then come and seek federal funds. Because if it's in your contract, that means you've already made that obligation. So we, we want to have used up that full pot of money for that fiscal year before you seek uh, reimbursement from federal funds. And then lastly, sort of a sticky situation we're helping one LEA through recently. If that contract or your policies talks about um, teachers or principals having to return course reimbursement funds if they leave uh, your district, right? If they're no longer employed there after a certain amount of time, First of all, you want to really think through that policy and then how you implement it, right? You don't want to be stuck in a situation where you're trying to get funds back after someone's already been paid and, you know, there's no enforcement mechanism for how they make sure they get those funds back to the district. 
And then kind of from our side, if you start to try to get those funds back, the full cost of the course needs to be returned to us. And we'll credit that uh, back to your account. But if you are going to take even just some of those funds back from the person who's no longer employed there, then the total amount for that course reimbursement has to be returned to the state. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you for working with uh, half of your information. I did put the newsletter blurb in the chat and I just will remind folks that this information is there in the site. So thank you for, for doing that. We lost half of your half of your update. Okay. Um, also, Andrea can't join us today, but if you read the newsletter religiously, which I'm sure you all have time and do every single month, um, MTSS office hours will take place weekly on Tuesdays from 3.30 to 4.30. For those of you, probably many of you know Andrea Logan. She's the MTSS specialist with the department, and she really uh, wants to ensure ESEA coordinators um, ha have sort of uh, an understanding that this is something they can pop into as well. Um, and usually this is like a no agenda style uh, where folks come with problems of practice of implementing MTSS structures to benefit student learning um, and behaviors in the classroom and at school. And then she does mention PD opportunities and things like that. I'm sure it's sort of a network of educators who are working together to kind of make MTSS work for them. Um, and thank you, Travis, who has just popped in the registration link that is linked there into the chat for folks that want to register um, and have that on their calendars. She may join us in the future, but just couldn't today. Um, I'm not sure about recorded sessions for MTSS. I can ask Andrea. Um, I know we record everything, but I'm not sure she does. So can certainly ask him and get back to you in the chat, Lisa, here in a moment. Uh, Tyra. Good morning, everyone. I'm super excited to share with you that we are in the planning phase of um, developing a consolidated federal fiscal office hours. So if you have um, joined the IDA or OSSI office hours in the past, we're hoping to collaborate and come together to provide one federal fiscal office hour uh, a month. Also, we are collaborating ESEA, uh, Emergency Relief, and Aussie are collaborating to present at Maine ASPO in November. We're excited to do that. It's going to be comprehensive. So if your business managers are a member of ASPO, please have them put that on the calendar. It is going to be uh, very informative for them. And just as a reminder, your substantial approval date for your FY24 application can be found on grants, uh, in Grants for Me. Um, and always remember that the date that you initially submit your application may not be the substantial approval date. The substantial approval date is important as you cannot obligate any funds prior to that substantial approval date. I am uh, sending out like a caution notice for um, districts that are using up their FY23 funds and possibly splitting. Um, the invoice between FY23 and FY24, make sure that those expenses fall within your period of performance for your FY24 um, application as well. I have seen where some Title I salaries and benefits, they are splitting like the end of the summer, so August, um, and they don't have substantial approval on their FY24 application. So those are not eligible for reimbursement. Next slide. Um, this is just a reminder of your FY21 funds. Liquidation period is now through December 30th. Please get your invoices in. Your funds should have been obligated by 
um, September 30th. Um, obligations should not be made prior to the substantial approval date, which we have already discussed. Um, Pre-award costs, if they have been approved, then your substantial approval date will revert back to 7-1. Accrued salaries cannot be reimbursed using current year funds. Salaries must be expensed in the fiscal year in which they were earned. Any contractual services should not be entered into until after the substantial approval date of your application. And I have the link in the uh, slide to um, the Code of Federal Regulations when obligations are made. Do folks need that? Uh, maybe someone can pop that in the chat. Those uh, Tyra makes does a good job of making sure we have active links to the CFR requirements. Um, so yes, just as always, and I apologize today, I did not send a reminder. It's one thing I forgot to do in the chaos of coming back Tuesday morning after a lovely long weekend. Uh, so upcoming ESCA virtual office hours, second Tuesday of each month. That means that for November, it happens to be the 14th. Um, you can plan on a newsletter publication on the 7th. Um, and that's usually when I do send the link to Zoom, and I'll try to remember the 14th in the morning to send a reminder like I normally do. Um, we will see you then, kind of after the two weeks of the deadline, past the deadline for the performance report. Um, and that'll be a good session to join, too, in case there are any other outstanding items happening. Um, and as always, the professional learning calendar is there. If someone can drop this chat, uh, this link in the chat as well, that would be helpful because Andrea did mention as we were chatting, Jess and I were chatting her just now, um, she doesn't record the sessions to answer Lisa's question because it's more of an open forum at this point, but there is apparently a more formal training and it's happening around MTSS on October 23rd. And she did say it was in the calendar. So you can take a look at that. Thank you, Travis. Um, and Tiffany's question, just because we're on trainings and professional learning, is Tyra, to Tyra, is the ASBO training online or in person? In person, November 17th. Thank you, Tyra. Okay. Um, as always, here we are. Uh, <laughs> it's at the Green Ladle in Lewiston. What? That sounds fun. Um, this time we weren't invited, but <laughs> that actually sounds fun. The green ladle. Um, okay. So yeah, as always contact information, you'll notice, right. Uh, Monique and Renee are both here still. Um, but I have entered Monique's, uh, contact information there. They're both on our website and the main homepage. Uh, and at this point, everybody emails us. So I feel like, you know, you know, our emails and you know, our phone numbers and continue to use them as you need. And here is where I will stop recording.